Hello everyone, it's so nice to see you again. Welcome back. When we last met, we were talking about irony. And some of you were still a little unsure that you could identify the three kinds of irony and explain whether something is or isn't ironic. So hopefully, after today's lesson, we'll be able to hash that out and everyone will be able to explain irony, explain what irony isn't, and identify an example of the three types. Levi, can I have you read the definition of situational irony, our first type? Thank you. When what we expect isn't what we get. Braylon, can you read the definition of verbal irony, our second type? Thank you. Someone says something, but they mean the opposite of what they say. And David, can you read the definition of dramatic irony, our third type? Thank you, yes. The audience knows something, the character doesn't. This is dramatic irony. And here we have three examples of situational irony. In our first picture, we have a cat chasing a dog. We don't normally expect to see cats chasing dogs. Usually it's the other way around. Dogs chasing cats. It's the exact opposite of what we expect. In our second example, we have the scary, spooky, haunted house that the children don't want to visit. Usually we expect a scary, spooky, haunted house to have a witch or a monster living there. Ironically, there's a little nice old lady living in this house. And this is probably one of my favorite examples. The third one is from a Disney movie called The Aristocats. In this story, the kind, friendly butler has been taking care of this old lady for a really long time, and she's very rich. He's hoping that she'll leave all his money, her money to her, him when he, she dies. He overhears a conversation she has with her lawyer where she's leaving all the money to the cats. Well, this is situationally ironic because we don't usually expect the old lady to leave her money to cats. And after hearing this, the butler decides to get rid of the cats. We don't expect the kind, friendly butler to become a bad guy and double cross the nice old lady. More situational irony. Oh, sorry, I have to clear this for you. Okay, and clear. I do apologize, everyone. Our next type of irony is verbal irony. As we mentioned before, someone says something, but they mean the opposite. Here we have the silly cloud saying, you look so happy to see me, to a really grumpy looking sun. Well, Mr. Sun likes to shine and he's only happy on a sunny day. So if Mr. Rain Cloud comes along, Mr. Sun's not gonna be happy and the cloud knows that. So it's verbal irony. And in our second picture, we have this really grumpy looking ironing board. And he says, yeah, I love my job, making clothes flat. Oh, please give me more of that action. <laughs> he obviously does not want to be ironed on anymore. Iron, irony, ha! <laughs> this is verbal irony. What he said isn't what he meant. And our final type of irony is dramatic irony. The audience knows something, the character doesn't. Can I have Elijah to read the comic strip, each bubble? Thank you. Garfield is telling us that he can't play fetch because he's too dignified. Well, first of all, a cat who's burping and scratching and coughing isn't very dignified. And second, we all know Garfield is super lazy and he just wants to sit around and eat lasagna. That's dramatic irony. We know something he doesn't know. Levi, can you read the speech bubbles in this comic strip about the Titanic? Thank you. The characters are expecting a wonderful vacation on the Titanic where we all know the boat's going to crash into an iceberg and tragically, a lot of people are going to die. That's dramatic irony. It's also meant to be funny because we all really know the story, so it's comedy. Now that we know what irony is, let's look at what irony isn't. One of my favorite songs 
to explore irony was written by Alanis Morissette. The song is called Ironic. But the only irony is it that most of her examples aren't ironic at all. Sorry, there's a commercial. So she's told us a couple of different examples here that she thinks are irony. The first one is an old man turns 98. He wants, wins the lottery and then he dies. Well, while this is rather unfortunate, very sorry for the old man, it's not ironic because there's nothing really super amazing about this. It's just an ordinary life coincidence. People die. That's just the way life goes. So sorry not irony. Our next one, she says, it's a black fly in your Chardonnay. Chardonnay is a wine, if anybody doesn't know that. A bug in your drink, it's not ironic. It's just an inconvenience. Nobody wants to have a bug in their drink, but that doesn't make it irony. Now, if you're a vampire and a waiter brings you a drink and there just happens to be a fly in it and you see it and you're like, oh, yay, thank you for this drink with a fly. I love drinking blood because I'm a vampire. Now, that would be ironic. And she also says it's like rain on your wedding day. Well, nobody wants rain on their wedding day, but rain in and of itself is just a coincidence. Sometimes it rains. Sometimes it doesn't. That's not irony. It's a coincidence. But if you had a guest walk up to you and say, oh, it's so nice that it's not raining today, and suddenly out of nowhere the sky starts pouring down, now it's ironic. Or I really like this one. You decide to marry a weatherman, and he picks the wedding date and told you it's going to be sunny, and it rains. Now it's ironic. The big idea here is that just because it's a coincidence doesn't make it irony. It's, it's just like if you were going to miss a plane and then it crashed, that's unfortunate, but it's a coincidence. It doesn't, it's not some gigantic, um, amazing opposite of what you expect. But if someone explained to you how a uh, safe air travel was and you didn't get on your plane and then it crashed, now we have a little bit of irony. Now we've reached the guided practice portion. And at this point, I would walk through these different examples with the students. Here we have a fire hydrant that's burning. Obviously, this is very ironic and students should be able to easily identify that we don't expect fire hydrants to be on fire because we usually expect them to put the fires out. And in the second one, we have a stop sign and it says stop defacing stop signs. So I would think that students would be able to identify this as verbal irony because there's a verbal message here that says the opposite of what, this, <laughs> what the people who made that sign said. You could also kind of call it situational irony because you're looking at a sign that you don't expect to be defaced. It is defaced and it tells you not to deface the stop signs. So we could almost argue that this stop sign is in fact both situational and verbal irony. But either way, the students should be able to identify this one. And then we would go through these additional examples of irony from Disney movies, which I think is a lot of fun because it brings in examples from shows that the students are familiar with, so that's easier to connect to. And they're also entertaining. It keeps students engaged when they have these beautiful, vibrant images because Disney's really great at giving us great imagery. So Simba's father dies and poor little Simba thinks that he's the cause. And yeah, we, the audience all knows that in fact, 
Scar killed him. So it's a pretty easy understanding of dramatic irony for students. This one might be a little bit harder for students um, only because you have to understand satire and some students don't. So this one might take more explaining on my part to help them see through it, but some students would get it. So that's also kind of nice. It's a great bridge between the easy ones and the harder ones. And there is a video to go along with that that um, we can watch to, and I can play real quick. And I think it's at minute 108, yeah. <laughs> so after watching the videos, it helps students connect a little bit better because we can hear the voices and how that implies meaning when some, with the way someone says something changes the way it's meant. So if it was, you know, plain ordinary speaking, yeah, I'm your conscience versus yeah, I'm your conscience. <laughs> that plays a role in helping us understand the irony as well. So I think the video really brings a nice piece to that for students as well. And then I also had some small group work here. And because seeing it up on a screen might be hard for students, I also would, in, if I was teaching this lesson for real, provide them worksheets to go along with this in advance that they could download so they can write in as they go along. And I don't know if K-12 has a ma manner for their platform to break into small groups, but I teach on Zoom a lot and we do have a breakout room session. So you can do that on Zoom where I've normally been teaching. I teach classes for out school. For, it's just a homeschool program on Zoom. And so I know that I can do that here. I would hope that uh, K-12 has a way to do that, but I don't know. So I planned it into the lesson. Hopefully it fits. And then of course, independent practice for the students. And I recognize that seeing these large examples on the screen could be a bit intimidating to some students. And it can also be visually distracting for students. And uh, it can just be a lot to take in because there's a lot of text here. So I created a worksheet for that as well, which has a nice column on the side that says, is it irony? And if so, what kind where the student can write in and identify if it's an example or a non-example of irony. And that's just more independent practice. And then for the, fin the final formal assessment, I created a ticket out the door, which was a Google form that I made and it's loading here, you can see that it's a quiz. So students could respond to it in the moment in the class, and then I could see those responses, and we can, we can, I would be able to know right away if there were still students who still needed additional help. And in that case, because this is already a lesson that's meant to have followed a lesson, then students would need uh, private tutoring, I would think at this point, if they didn't understand it this time. But it would be nice because you get instant feedback, and the student get. I can then give the student feedback back to let them know um, where they need additional help or if hopefully they got them all right, which I would, would be my hope in this case is that they would rock it through this. Oh, sorry. And then I had the list of resources which I discussed and a picture of my guided note sections just so you could see it a little bit better in person and the group worksheet. I actually didn't like the way this printed out on my computer after I made it. So if I were going to make this again for a real lesson, I would actually want to extend it down and put more space in between them. It looked different on my computer screen than when Microsoft Word printed it out on my printer. So that's one thing I would do different as a teacher. And I really love this form that was the guided, the notes for the independent work. And I have a lot of ideas here for different accommodations. If students had IEPs or needed something specific to help them on, with the material a little bit better, which was of course the guided notes, which aren't just great for students with IEPs. They're great for everybody because it helps you stay focused. It helps you follow along with a lesson. So I think they're great for everybody, but they do help students with IEPs. I recognize that there are lots of examples throughout this lesson of each kind of irony. And if there are a lot of students that that would be distracting for, I could remove and reduce the number of examples, or I could provide them a simplified version of the PowerPoint in advance, which just has only one or two of each example instead of three or four. 
and that just goes right to the graphics and the small the small group slides have a lot of work so if that's too much for some students it could be reduced or it could be eliminated if you don't have the option for doing breakout because I don't know if K-12 has that but it's an option for helping ac accommodate students. I love mixing ability groups when it's possible because it helps the the, I, the advanced students, it helps them think through ways to help other people understand things, which is a great critical thinking skill, and it helps uh, scaffold students who are struggling a little bit more. And, and again, the independent um, slides were very wordy, so that's why I made that worksheet. Uh, I have another slide. I'm sorry, it's not loading. I don't know why. There it is. Okay. I. Um, went through a list of different kinds of assistive technologies and thought about ways that they could be implemented with this lesson. Because there is so much text and so many graphics, if a student was visually impaired, they might want to use a screen magnifier. If someone doesn't want to um, listen to the whole lesson, they could read closed captioning if, they're, uh, if they have sensory issues. Um, noise canceling headphones are really great for both teachers and students because it helps with focus and it helps uh, drown out the, any additional noise that are in students' backgrounds. So it's, in, it's great to encourage all teachers and all students to wear headphones whenever possible, though I recognize sometimes that's not going to happen because I have been teaching online for three years now and despite my best efforts to get students to wear headphones, they still don't always do it. But that's just life. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to hearing from you. Bye.